foundation course in palliative medicine. And today we'll be going to discuss about one of the vast and uh, interesting topic in palliative medicine, uh, delirium. And we have a uh, eminent faculty, Dr. Neil uh, Nijavan joining us for the evening to walk us through the session. For formal faculty introduction for the session facilitation, I hand over it to Dr. Sunil Kumar, sir, over to you. Thank you, Sripsia, and good evening, everybody. So today, um, we are going to discuss about uh, one of the one of an important symptom, which is uh, usually not recognized and not treated properly, and uh, uh, the uh, problems which we usually think uh, may not happen uh, or may not um, uh, cause a delirium, uh, even can cause delirium, and that is uh, one of the important. Uh, symptom which you can see in patients admitted with uh, patients admitted in ICU, uh, and it is uh, uh, it is a common symptom among palliative care patients due to many reasons. So uh, today, um, Dr. Neil Arun Nijavan will take us through uh, the topic of delirium, and uh, he has done his um, MBBS from King's College London. After that, uh, he pursued um, palliative medicine. Uh, in London, uh, but during that, he <laughs> went back to his um, own country, West Indies, and uh, set up a palliative care unit there in um, in a hospital, uh, Quora Hospital, uh, which had uh, inpatient or patient uh, units. Um, uh, and uh, uh, after completing his uh, training, he worked as a consultant in Imperial College uh, Healthcare uh, NHS Trust in London, and uh, where he was the clinical lead of palliative medicine. Uh, then Dr. Nijavan uh, is the first licensed palliative care physician in Abu Dhabi, uh, and he practiced all aspects of palliative medicine. And uh, uh, he, uh, uh, we know palliative care is uh, looking at the, uh, at the total care of the patient and family, and he also believes in that. And he believes that uh, that will provide uh, better uh, medical uh, treatment. Uh, the patient can tolerate if we look at the total uh, pain aspect of the patient. And he is the um, representative, uh, UA representative to WHO Mediterranean Region uh, Palliative Care Expert Network. So, thank, uh, welcome, Dr. Neil Arun, and uh, it's over to you. Thank you. Um, so let me, how do I share screen? Um, so can you guys see my screen? I uh, know. Not yet? Oh, what am I doing no. wrong? Sorry. Not yet. Um, so share, oh, here we go. Okay. Uh, yeah, you can see that now, right? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Let me just. Uh, okay. Doke. Cool. Yeah. So let me just move this. Um, so thank you very much, guys, for the uh, very very kind introduction. I think I need to reduce my introduction. It's too many words. Uh, but thank you very much for the opportunity to present. Um, and apologies for missing the session last week. I, it was completely uh, chock a block in clinic, so my, my apologies for that. Um, so I don't I don't want this to be too uh, didactic and and boring, um, because you guys are all doctors. You will have seen a delirium, and we're not really covering delirium in the ICU setting. Um, I try to to limit things to delirium in palliative care. Um, so we'll make a start. So how do I move forward? Okay, so when you when you think about delirium in, in palliative care, I, I Google searched uh, delirium in palliative care, and this was the first image that came up. Um, and it's actually quite nice, it's very wordy, uh, but it covers literally everything we're going to talk in the presentation. Um, and I'm quite a visual learner, so I've put it here and you guys will have access to the slides. Um, but if you need a, a, a sort of a one page review of delirium, this is this is quite nice. So we'll go into a little bit more detail now. 
So this, this is what we'll cover, uh, definition, uh, symptoms, risk factors, uh, recognition and management, um, and particularly in the context of palliative care, why communication and collaborative working is important. So this, this is delirium. So um, delirium we know is, is, a, it's, is very common. It's a, a sudden and usually reversible uh, decline in cognitive function. And what you actually see in the patients is typically a drop or a fluctuation in their GCS, their level of attention and their cognitive ability. And invariably, and particularly so in palliative care, the causes of delirium are not likely to be one single thing. They're usually multifactorial. And delirium is a really, really common problem in the palliative care setting. If you look at the, the evidence, and, and I did a little literature search before putting the slides together, the papers that I look at give prevalence figures anywhere from sort of 13 to 93%. So it's a hugely problematic problem. Uh, we, we know that most patients who are having end of life care, almost 100% of them will have delirium at some point in the hours to days just before death. And we also know, and I hope people recognize that in palliative care, particularly end of life care, uh, delirium is a sign of impending death. Um, and while we may be familiar with it and we can recognize it, uh, family distress is, is particularly marked with, with delirium. And most people, if you work on a, on a specialist palliative care unit, if you have a patient who's got very, very marked terminal agitation, terminal restlessness, you know how that one patient can just upset the dynamic on the entire unit or entire ward. So it's, it's, a, it's a, a phenomenon that is not managed very well. People are often very hesitant to, to treat it aggressively. Um, but if it's not managed, it causes huge amounts of distress, both for the patients, the families, and the staff on the unit. So this I've, is this a nice sort of algorithm I've stolen from the BMJ, but I have referenced it at the bottom. So it's a nice algorithm about how you, how you work out um, the causes of delirium or whether a patient in fact has delirium or not. It's quite busy. I'll, I'll let you have a look at it in your own time. Um, but we'll go into a little bit more detail as the slides go along. So in your reading, you will come across um, two main types of delirium, so the hyperactive or hypoactive delirium. And I'm sure most people, if you've done medicine for any period of time, you will have seen both. You see in hypoactive patients, they typically are lethargic, quite drowsy. They have almost cognitive slowing, so they respond to questions extremely slowly, they don't often initiate normal activity movements, and they seem to have a reduced awareness of their surroundings. Now, if you've not looked after this patient before, it's quite easy to mistake hypoactive delirium for somebody who is fatigued, depression, or dementia. Um, hyperactive delirium is the delirium that most people will be familiar with, and it's typically manifested by restlessness, agitations, the patient's hypervigilant, they may be hallucinating or having delusions. And if you're not sure, it can be confused with sort of anxiety or psychosis. Like many things in medicine, things are often not very black and white, and you can often get a mixed picture where patients will manifest both elements of hyperactive and hypoactive delirium. And what's really, really important is actually delirium fluctuates. So um, you may have periods where the patient is completely lucid, absolutely crystal clear thought, normal behavior. Then half an hour later, they'll dip into that very, very um, odd uh, cognitive state. <clears throat> so delirium is fluctuating. And I put up a number of slides here, which I'm not going to a huge amount of detail, but this generally from recollection has always come up in exams. How do you differentiate between delirium and dementia? Um, to me, it's obvious, you know, dementia is not something that happens immediately, whereas um, delirium, the changes do occur very, very quickly. Dementia is a much more progressive phenomenon and gets worse over time. Uh, delirium, you know, you've got an inattention and inability to maintain focus, whereas patients with dementia, for example, their memory could be dreadful, but in that particular time that you assess them, they are alert and they can focus, but their memory is very, very bad. So there's a very significant difference. And as already mentioned, delirium, the symptoms fluctuate throughout the day from day to day, whereas in dementia, that cognitive impairment tends to be very, very static. Um, so again, there are hundreds of charts like this in the textbooks and, and online, so I won't labor the point. 
This is where things get a little bit more interesting. So this, this I've taken from a very nice review, which was done a number of years ago, sort of delirium and palliative care patients. And uh, this was a lovely, lovely um, uh, graphic about what the usual causes are. So if we just start up at the top, you know, metabolic abnormalities, high per hypocalcemia, high per hyponatremia, low magnesium. Most of our patients in palliative care will have some metabolic abnormality. Many of our cancer patients will have had side effects from chemo radiation. Sepsis definitely causes um, um, delirium. Uh, if your volume status is, is not ideal, that can certainly precipitate or tip you towards delirium. Any endocrine uh, abnormalities, uh, paraneoplastic syndromes, if you've got CNS involvement of tumors, so parenchymal brain mat, leptomeningeal disease, stroke. Um, and then, okay, we talked a lot about sort of me uh, medical conditions, but things that, that may pre-exist and have nothing to do with the, the main reason uh, for the patient being uh, at the end of life, for example. So patient may have alcohol or benzodiazepine withdrawal. There may be nutritional deficiencies. If they're anemic, these are things that are going to predispose you to becoming more delirious. Any organ failure or dysfunction. So if you've got heart failure, liver failure, renal failure, and you are just about maintaining a steady balance, then you get a UTI or you have a fall those patients are more than 90% likely to end up in the delirious state. And then you come on to medications. So this is something we, we, we see a lot in palliative care. Many of our medications are centrally acting. So opioids, anticholinergics, anti-secretory drugs, uh, steroids can tip you into hyperactive delirium, antidepressants can affect your salt levels, um, anticholinergic activity, benzodiazepines, and neuroleptics. So the list of things to choose from in terms of uh, causating uh, agents for delirium is, is huge. And this is not an exhaustive list. Um, clearly, if patients are hypoxic or hypoxemic, that will also predispose them to delirium. So the reason I put this slide here, and certainly not to make people make a list, is to just emphasize the point that actually the causes of delirium are so varied that when you're trying to get to reversible causes, your differential needs to be quite wide just to make that point. And again, you know, delirium, um, junior doctors, medical students like to have mnemonics. I can never remember them, but I quite like this delirium mnemonic uh, for causes of delirium. Um, so D for drugs, E for epilepsy, electrolyte disturbances, L for liver failure or low oxygen, I for infections, R for retention, I for intracranial causes, U for uremia, and M for metabolic doesn't matter what you use, as long as your differential is wide and, and you consider all the possible causes. <clears throat> We've talked a lot about, or just mentioned a lot about causes, but if you actually look at a pathophysiological level as to what are the things that sort of predispose people to a delirium, <laughs> the list is equally long. I actually took out one of the slides, which is the sort of predisposing and precipitating factors for delirium. But at a pathophysiological level, you know, you can get neuronal dysfunction and, and injury. There's neurotransmitter disturbance, um, imbalance in the neurokine or endocrine um, immune cell uh, balances, um, metabolic insufficiency, um, neurodegenerative changes in patients with dementia. This is why dementia patients are more likely to get uh, delirium. Again, this is a very busy slide. You don't need to remember it. Um, but there are many, many things happening in the background that, that we aren't necessarily aware of. Um, and usually you have to say, well, I've excluded all of potentially reversible causes. And despite going through that diagnosis of exclusion, patient is still delirious. There may be some pathophysiological basis for it that we, we, we are simply not able to pinpoint or reverse. So when we say iatrogenic, it's not as simple as iatrogenic. It's more likely that actually we can't demonstrate an obvious reversible pathology. Um, the next couple of slides are about delirium screening and delirium screening tools. So this was a systematic review done, I think two years ago, where they looked at uh, the number of tools, uh, delirium screening tools that are validated in palliative care. And the upshot of it is none of them are validated in palliative care. Um, we can't recommend one versus the other. There are so many to choose from. Um, you know, you've got MDAS, you've got the RAS score, you've got the 4AT, you've got 
scores I've never even heard of. None of them have really been validated in a palliative end of life care setting. And really and truly, it doesn't matter which assessment tool that you use. What's more important is that you're actually uh, consistent in the tool that you use or consistent in the approach that you use when assessing somebody for delirium. So we talked a bit about the causes um, and the likely causes of, of delirium. And we'll touch a little bit on the management of delirium. And, and basically this is the, the algorithm. So as much as you're able to, you want to identify and treat an underlying cause. Um, secondly, you want to sort of optimize the patient's environment. And this is where the non-pharmacological side of uh, managing delirium comes into play. And then you've got pharmacological or medica medications to use. This is a slightly busier version of that last slide. So if you look at the algorithm on the left in the sort of olive green, um, if you want to both reverse the delirium and treat the symptoms, then you, you go through this algorithm of trying to figure out what, what the reversible causes are, identify those precipitants and treat them. You know, if there's no, no other modifiable precipitants, then you've likely got non-reversible delirium. If on the other hand, in the blue algorithm, your, your purpose or the intention is purely just to control symptoms, um, then you generally uh, tend to reach for pharmacological or environmental modifications quicker. Um, and we'll go in, into a little bit more detail. This is generally the case in the end of life care setting. Um, uh, but this is not to say that just because a patient is approaching end of life, you don't exclude reversible causes. That is still worth doing because don't forget the more medications you put on board, the more sedation, um, the less likely patients are able to communicate, which is often very important for family members. And again, none of these resources are, are, are unique or proprietary. These are things that we pull from textbooks, so you can access this quite easily. And the main thing about, I guess, managing delirium, certainly this is my approach, is that it's better to prevent it. Um, so in palliative care, we, we really focus on patient comfort. And particularly in a palliative care setting, we want the patient awake, you want them calm, you want them to be pain free. And as much as possible, you want them to be cognitively awake and alert and able to communicate. Particularly in this part of the world, I'm practicing in the Middle East now, and even when family members accept that the patient is approaching the end of life, there's a huge amount of distress about the fact that the patient is getting sleepier, even in the absence of sedating medicines. So there's a lot of education for the carer and the family members to understand one, uh, what are the changes that happen in the dying process? And two, what also happens in the dying process when delirium is added to the mix. So management of delirium, you know, you, you, you have to be aware of patient safety, um, where's the best place to care for the patient. And again, huge amounts of information and educating the patients and the families. And then you move on to the correction of the reversible causes. And, and I picked these, uh, number in red they're not the entire list we've already touched on that but certainly opioid rotation opioid dose reduction treating constipation urinary retention is the patient hypercalcemic is there an infection um, and avoiding dehydrations and any other mediators of distress and it's again i i, I don't like laboring the point because you're all doctors you will have seen patients with delirium but common things are common and it's always worth having a sort of surgical sieve in mind. What's your approach for, for dealing um, with delirium? Um, you do have to be aware that delirium is quite a, it's quite a distressing um, phenomenon, particularly patients' families. Um, when patients are agitated and you've got a predominantly hyperactive delirium, there is something called a destructive triangle that you should be aware of. This is quite an old concept. I didn't get taught about this when I was training, but I, I did come across it in the reading. So basically a patient may have delirium. They have a predominantly hyperactive form of delirium and they're quite agitated and unsettled. The relatives and the caregivers understandably become more distressed because of that distress they then pressure the carers, the nurses to increase the sedation and analgesia to alleviate the perceived suffering of that patient then you end up with inappropriate escalation of opioid sedatives, which means more sedation, increased risk of opioid toxicity, and increased agitation. So, you know, there are many things in medicine that can tip us into this sort of vicious cycle or destructive triangle, but you really, really 
in addition to the medicines and, and treating reversible causes, equal amounts of time needs to be spent with the family and those around the dying person, particularly to explain to them that actually agitation is part of delirium. Um, if you don't, uh, their perception may be quite skewed that actually uh, somebody is, is, is in agony. Um, it is difficult. And like I said at the beginning, not just the family members, if the nurses on the ward, the doctors on the ward are not uh, capable of one, recognizing and managing delirium, that, that agitation and angst and being very unhappy and unsettled spreads like a virus across the ward. And it'll really, really upset the dynamic on the ward. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to touch on the non-pharmacological management. <clears throat> I just had a cold, so my throat is going. Apologies. Um, again, these are very, very similar uh, or familiar things to most doctors. Um, this is uh, adapted from a, a quite an old paper, uh, 2008, uh, Agitation and Delirium at the End of Life. And again, th these are things that, that you will have come across in hopefully care of the elderly rotations, caring for geriatric patients, caring for patients with dementia. There's a lot about sort of um, uh, maintaining day-night cycle, maintaining normal behavior during daytime and, and good sleep hygiene, making sure there is orientation so patients can tell when it's daytime, um, they can tell what day of the week, they have familiar surroundings, you, you minimize things that are likely to cause distress, infections, dehydrations, bladder, bowel retention, um, and especially if the patient's plucking and picking and is agitated, remove as many of these lines. If they've got lines that, that can be removed, it's always better to take the lines out because it's just another thing for the patient to pluck. And again, you, 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 it's, it's something that we encounter quite a lot here in the Middle East. Uh, often the, the day-night cycle is shifted, so people tend to go to bed very late in the day, very late at night, so patients and family members uh, tend to turn up late in the evening and they'll want to be with the patient there'll be mobile phones going music is playing actually that's the opposite of what you need you need a much more um, not regimented but very clear this is activity time this is sleeping time the patient needs to be in a calm dark room if it's night time all of the things that you would normally do for patients with uh, dementia um, actually apply here it's the same stuff these are the things that are often missed it's very easy to reach for medicines, but if you're not in a clinical environment, you're not at home, you're not on the palliative care ward, there is a significant role for all of these non-pharmacological interventions. And this is where the family members need to be engaged. And you will know family members say, look, they feel very, very helpless, particularly when somebody's coming to the end of life. They want to do something. Engage them in this sort of stuff. Let them take responsibility for it. Um, this is a clinical talk, so I have to talk to you about what the evidence shows. So looking back at the evidence and, and looking back at some of the clinical guidelines that, that, that have, we are familiar with in palliative care, uh, the evidence is, is really not great for, for a lot of these non-pharmacological interventions. They all recommend them, um, but again, this is the absence of evidence. It does not mean there's evidence of, of no benefit. Um, so as more practice guidelines say, most of the non-pharmacological interventions have no evidence to substantiate its use, but still recommend them. Um, uh, Cochrane systematic reviews uh, talk about multi-component approaches to dealing with delirium, um, but they would then go on to say that actually these approaches have little to no effect on the risk of dying in hospital. Um, a special note about hyperactive delirium. Um, particularly in palliative care when patients are terminally agitated uh, approaching the end of life. Uh, hyperactive delirium is often the, the thing that causes most grief. I think you need to take a pragmatic approach. Um, you know, if the patients are a danger to themselves and others, despite reversing what you can reverse, despite the non-pharmacological interventions, then you need to use medications. Again, there's no real evidence base for this, uh, and it's a pragmatic approach. And the rule of thumb, generally, if you look at most guidelines, they will split it into antipsychotic and sedative use. So if the patient has predominantly hallucinations, delusions, they'll talk about using antipsychotics. If the patient's very agitated and there's an anxiety component or time is very, very short, you tend to favor the use of benzodiazepine or dexmedetomidine or Presidex. And again, we'll come into a bit more detail about these medicines. 
It's important to say that actually terminal delirium, terminal agitation, terminal restlessness should be treated pharmacologically if the family feel that agitation is a source of suffering. And again, those of us who do work in palliative care, there will be a cohort of patients that you could almost predict are more likely to become terminally agitated. The younger patients, the patients who are still not aware of their conditions, those who are really haven't made peace with their condition, uh, family members who turn up late um, and haven't been involved in the care of the patients, family members who have a significant amount of guilt. These are very, very well recognized phenomenons uh, that increase the risk of terminal restlessness. So um, medications, and again, any review of, of managing delirium and palliative care will cover this to some degree. This is generally what I do. Um, most guidelines will have a variation on this. So typically first line tends to be haloperidol. And again, if you've got hepatic or renal impairment, you tend to start with lower doses with a longer PRN interval, usually half a milligram to three milligrams, again, starting with the lowest dose. You may find the PRN doses alone are enough especially if there's no reversible causes found, um, but then you may need to set up an infusion. And it's very rare that I need to get anywhere near 10 milligrams of haloperidol. In fact, I very rarely go above three milligrams per 24 hours. And it's important to say there, there, there is a, a newer generation of antipsychotics. Um, the most recent systematic reviews in the use of antipsychotics for agitation shows no greater benefit, particularly in that last stage of, of life. Benzodiazepines tend to be uh, second line. Um, clearly, they don't make cognition worse. They increase sedation, but they can reduce anxiety. And it's worth, this is where taking a good history comes into to view. If you've got a patient with a known history of anxiety, generalized anxiety, there's a significant fair factor that should be in the notes because when the terminal agitation creeps up, you may want to use a benzodiazepine preferentially. And again, you can use lorazepam, you can use midazolam. Um, benzos are useful if patient, patients are withdrawing, particularly alcoholic withdrawal, benzodiazepine, or even antidepressant withdrawal. And in patients with Parkinson's as well, it, it does have a role. And again, third line, you're now, you, you've used your benzos, you've used bigger doses of haloperidol, but you're at the stage where you're happy that there is nothing else to be reversed um, and you need a higher level of sedation, then the doses tend to get a little bit more serious. So Medazolam, we can go from 10 to 30 milligrams infusion over 24 hours. Or if you're giving rectal diazepam, 5 to 10 milligrams, you know, three to four times a day. Um, you may want to go from haloperidol to levomepromazine, depending on your setting. And typically, if I'm reaching for levomepromazine um, and I want to sedate the patient, my PRN dose of levomepromazine, the normal body weight is 25 milligrams. If they're less than that, then I tend to use 12.5. And again, levomepromazine doses uh, in, a, in an infusion anywhere from 25 to 200 milligrams over 24 hours. And these are profoundly sedating medications at these doses. Um, most of the patients that you use these medications for will be bed bound, but not always. You will find the odd exception. This is standard stuff. This is the stuff that I think most people will use or have access to. Then I've gone a little bit left field because this is something that I've had to do more commonly in palliative care, and particularly here in the Middle East. Um, uh, we, we do use um, Presidex a little bit more frequently. This is unlikely to be used outside the hospital setting and rarely used outside the ICU setting. Um, I don't know what your experience is, and maybe we can talk about that. Um, it's a relatively new medication, it's an alpha-2 agonist. Um, in low doses... It, we've got both sedative and analgesic property. And, and the reason why the ICU setting it is used is because it doesn't affect respiratory drive. But you do have a high chance of uh, bradyarrhythmias, which is why patients tend to be in ICU being monitored. For patients in, in, I guess, in the hospitalized monitored setting or even an ICU at the end of life, um, you know, you can bolus them at one mic per kilogram or even very, very low dose, 0 0.2 to 0 0.6 mics per kilogram per hour as an infusion, especially if you, you, you don't want to sedate them too much and you're worried about the effect of opioids or benzodiazepines on respiration. 
And again, there is good evidence for the use of Dexdoor or Presidex in a palliative care setting. But often what, what you find is that actually it's not a sustained effect. And as the end of life period progresses, more than 50% of uh, patients' families want a higher level of sedation. And so most patients will end up getting bigger doses of either benzodiazepines or levomiprozine. So I've put the references both throughout the presentation and right here at the end. I'm aware that that was a bit of a whistle stop tour, but I don't want to teach you guys to suck eggs. The whole point of Project ECHO teaching should be sort of collaborative and discussive. So uh, I'll, I'll hand over now and I think there's another presentation and then that gives us a lot of time for discussion. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Neil Adam. Uh, so, um, if you have any doubts, uh, we can discuss that and uh, thereafter we will go for case presentation. Was, was, was anybody okay. going to do another presentation? I can see there are a few questions in the chat. Okay. Okay. Uh, which assessment tool do you routinely use? That was one question. <laughs> yeah, so it's really bad. I, I'm, I'm very naughty. I don't use any assessment tool. Um, pre predominantly because um, I, I don't find any of them particularly useful. Uh, it, this, is, this is not to say that they aren't useful. Some people find them very, very useful. Other people less so. Um, I don't want you to get fixated on it. The, the, the thing that actually has the most impact is being familiar with the patient. Actually, the more familiar you are with the patient, the easier it is for you to pick up these um, changes. But whatever tool that you use, uh, it's important that everybody in your unit or the place that you work is using the same tool for consistency. So consistency is more important than the actual tool. Uh, and uh, another question is on dexmedetomidine infusion. Uh, can it be mm -hmm. uh, uh, not to be used, uh, infused more than 24 hours? So no, I, I, be, I, yeah. no, no, yeah. I, I was, maybe I wasn't clear in the slide. It can be. I have certainly put patients on Presidex infusions for three or four days, especially if we are clear that uh, this is an end of life setting. We're absolutely clear that there's nothing reversible, no more blood tests, no more investigations but the Presidex is working well for them. Um, it can be continued for a number of days. It's not an issue. Yeah, and there is another question regarding availability of levomipromacin in India. I think it is not available for us. Ah, uh, it's okay. more of available in UK. Uh, that's what I believe. So what, um, what, what, what can I ask then? So I should learn from you guys as well. I mean, we, we, I've worked in other parts of the world where we don't have levomipromacin, so we use drugs like Chlorpromazine or prochlorperazine. What, what do you guys have access to in India? Uh, we usually manage delirium with uh, haloperidol and uh, midazolam. And uh, if okay. it is not uh, controlled with uh, that, uh, then uh, dexmedetomidine is one option, but uh, it is costly. Uh, so yes. we go for thiopendone. Wait, which one? Thiopendone, thiopendone. Oh, you, oh, wow. Okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So yes, I, I didn't, I did. That's actually an omission from my slides. So I was trained in the UK. So we, um, this is our, our um, ladder, almost like the WHO pain ladder. The ladder for agitation is, is uh, antipsychotics, so haloperidol, uh, then benzodiazepines, um, then third line like levomipromazine. And if levomipromazine is not working, then we reach for phenobarbitone. And then if oh. phenobarbitone is not working, Presidex. If Presidex is not working, then you're into the realms of propofol. But propofol yeah. requires ICU. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I, I've been doing palliative care since uh, 2010, and I've never used propofol. I've never okay. had to use propofol. And interestingly, okay. in the UK, and I don't know whether this is related, the doses of opioids we use in the UK are much, much higher working out in the Caribbean, working here in the Middle East, our doses of opioids are much less. And the number of times or the number of instances where I've had to use levomipromazine for severe agitation is also much less. 
So I, I uh, don't know whether that's a cultural thing. It's because we're using less drug. I don't know. Difficult uh, to say. So uh, I would like to tell you that uh, um, most of our teaching uh, is from uh, physicians from UK. Uh, okay. So the first generation palliative care doctors are trained by um, starbucks in uh, palliative care like Dr. Robert Cruz and uh, mm -hmm. uh, so person like that, uh, people like that. So most, uh, we also follow uh, the UK. Um, okay. <laughs> yeah. uh, but uh, there are uh, the non-availability of medication is uh, so, uh, something which uh, is a big is issue. A problem. Yeah. yeah. And the cost can, can, can I ask? Also, Yes, yes, that makes it. What, what about giving uh, thiopental phenobarbitone type drugs in the community? Can you do that? Um, it, it can be uh, because uh, 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 many people may not use it in the community, but uh, our political unit, uh, we teach uh, the caregiver uh, how to administer uh, hydroperidol yes. and midazolam uh, at their home. True, true. Uh, I mean, and, uh, so I see... Yeah. Uh, Sorry, sorry to interrupt. Yes. I saw I saw somebody said, "What about uh, Fenagon?" So Fenagon, Lagactyl, all of these, uh, and the, these are the same family of drugs as levomepromazine, phenothiazine drugs. Um, many of these medicines can be given intramuscularly, um, and it, it is cheaper and it can be used. In the UK, it has fallen out of favor because the majority of palliative care patients, or no, the majority of patients who we often look after at the end of life don't have much muscle. So we try and avoid giving IM injections. Um, but occasionally when there really isn't any choice, I have used it. Um, and the other nice thing is that levomepromazine you can give subcutaneously. It's very, very well characterized to use subcut. So I appreciate the, the differences in availability, but um, it's it, I, I don't know. I, I, do you guys get a lot of terminal agitation in the community? Do you see a lot? Um, uh, yeah, uh, not a lot, but uh, still we get uh, patients with um, agitation. Um, and uh, we do use subcutaneous route a lot uh, rather than uh, intravenous. And uh, we, uh, you can say maybe 99.99% we don't use intramuscular route. Um, okay. So, mm. if it is in the community, we usually uh, administer medication subcutaneously. Okay, okay. Because it is That's easy for the family to uh, learn and uh, uh, we can also control. Otherwise, uh, there will be some problem if uh, uh, put an IV and if accidentally uh, it got displaced, uh, there will be bleeding, family will be uh, panicking and uh, those situations. So we usually uh, put uh, subcutaneous life. Mm. And and can I ask you? Do, in the I know it will vary from community to community, but your when you give subcutaneous medications, are you teaching the family members how to administer this, or is it a nurse or a palliative care team worker? Uh, and uh, uh, compared to NHS, uh, uh, we don't have. Uh, the nurses supplied by the government. Uh, the family okay. needs to find out the nurses and it will be too difficult for them to find out a nurse. So what uh, uh, what we do is uh, we teach the family member uh, how to administer uh, the medication. Uh, so we'll tell them this much uh, have to be pushed uh, every hourly or uh, four hourly, Understood. something like that. <clears throat> So it's, it's, it, the reason I ask is because, you know, everybody's practice is different depending on where they work. So I've not worked in the UK now for about three years. Um, and the difficulty we face here in, in certainly in the UAE is that centrally acting medicines, opioids, antiemetics, antipsychotics, sedatives, benzos, no, we are not allowed to prescribe these medicines outside the hospital, period. So, okay. um, you know, if I think in the last three years, I've had two patients have end of life care at home, only oh. two. Okay. Um, you know, culturally, culturally, people want to be in hospital if they're sick. I understand that. But also there isn't that, 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 that network of community services and, and backup 
even if we could give these medicines, how are you going to, you know, you need a nursing on call, you need a doctor on call. So it, it, it's not, um, it's not easy. Uh, but it's nice that actually you guys can still do stuff in, in the home setting, which is really important. Cool. Um, I, I saw somebody said, can we use propofol? My, my, the teaching that I always had with propofol is that, you know, once, once you're reaching for propofol, these patients need to be managed in the ICU setting um, with management of the airway, um, appropriate hydration, appropriate nutrition, especially if you're sort of doing a palliative sedation type picture. If you think prognosis is hours to days, I guess that's less of an issue. But if you've got somebody with such severe terminal agitation and sedation is the only way to manage the symptoms, but prognosis is likely to be weeks, then it becomes more complicated with putting somebody on, on, on propofol sedation. Then you need to support the body for that much longer. Um, Those are just my thoughts on it. Yeah. Cool. So I'm assuming uh, everybody so, is... Uh, can I ask... Uh, please, uh, please go ahead. Uh, you had mentioned that there is a ladder, like if we start with haloperidol and if haloperidol doesn't work, we move on to benzos. Mm. So in a, in a setting where delirium is in acute condition, how long uh, do you give a trial of hal haloperidol for? Yeah, Before good, good you question. declare that this is not working. Yeah, so I think this is why we tend to use PRN medicines first. So if you give PRN medicines um, and you've given an adequate window of, of time to, to assess a response, you know, generally we would have PRN haloperidol prescribed, PRN midazolam prescribed, and PRN levomipromazine prescribed. First line, second line, third line. So the nurses have an instruction as to which ones to use first and a clear instruction as to, to, to feedback um, which, which one you think is, is, is more appropriate for the patient. And then we can we can go with that, no, but, but it's not uh, the, either or. The PRN is for uh, like how many days? I mean, do you give haloperidol for say two days, and if it is not controlling, is it something like that? That was my question. So, so this is what I mean. So if, if we're in that environment uh, where we're expecting end of life, all of those medicines are prescribed on the PRN basis. So the nurses have the flexibility and the discretion to try haloperidol first. Half an hour, an hour is not making any difference. You can increase, give it another half an hour, an hour, no difference. Go to Medaz and, and ramp up that way. Again, uh, different, different places will have a different level of, of, of tolerance for doing it that quickly. But certainly in a palliative, in a hospice setting, for example, all of these medicines will be prescribed PRN. So it just depends on your, on your level of risk and safety in the environment you're operating in. And uh, haloperidol and midas cannot be given together. It can, it can, very much can. Especially if you think um, uh, there's a significant anxiety component or you need to just break the, the cycle, then I, I would give haloperidol and midas together, especially because haloperidol will not act immediately. It'll take at least 15, 20, 30 minutes sometimes, depending on metabolism. But if you need to break the cycle and calm them down, that's what benzos are good for. But you can certainly give them together. We do. Doctor uh, Sunil, sir, we do this. We do this same way. Uh, like so like our, sir mentioned. Our, our practice is that uh, we will try with haloperidol and uh, um, maybe 1.5 to 2.5 milligram bolus doses. And uh, mm -hmm. if the patient's agitation is not controlled with 5 milligram of haloperidol, then we will add midazolam to it. Uh, uh, so um, then uh, um, once it is controlled, we will uh, uh, give a continuous infusion of uh, midazolam uh, along uh, with the bolus doses of uh, haloperidol. And the maximum uh, dose uh, usually what is used is uh, 20 milligrams per 24 hours of haloperidol. And um, 20, 20 uh, milligrams? Yeah. Uh, Big, uh, yeah. So uh, we use up to 20 milligram, but uh, literature says uh, there is no limit. Uh, people use uh, lots True. of amount of haloperidol, but we restrict it to 20 milligram per 24 hour. But uh, in mm. case of midazolam, uh, patients uh, would need a high amount of uh, midazolam. 
uh, it may be up to three milligram, four milligram, five milligram per hour infusion. Uh, the uh, action of uh, midazolam is short. Uh, so we have to do right. it as a continuous right. infusion. But uh, for right. haloperidol, its uh, duration of action is long. So we can give it as a bonus dose. And, and this is why we tend to say use use haloperidol first line just on a PRN basis because it, it, it has such a long half-life. Even if you need to give some PRN benzodiazepines in between, and by the time the haloperidol starts working, you know it, 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 the pattern should become obvious. Um, and once it is clear that a patient needs dosing on a continuous basis, I will start an infusion with both the benzo and the haloperidol together. I tend to sort of do, do a cumulative effect. And so for how many for days, uh, so this uh, goes on the infusion or the treatment for? So it depends if this is an end of life setting, then the infusions continue for as long as it's needed. If it's a purely getting on top of symptoms to buy you some time while you reverse or treat reversible causes, then it's until you need it for. Once you've treated the reversible causes and hopefully you see some clinical improvement, then you can start weaning down. Thank you, sir. So no, 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 no. Um, we just uh, want you to understand that uh, Haloperidol is the, or antipsychotic is the first drug of choice for delirium. Uh, but uh, um, uh, benzodiazepine is an add-on medication. Uh, so if you give benzodiazepine uh, for a patient who has delirium, that will actually aggravate delirium. So that's why you first use uh, antipsychotics like haloperidol, mm -hmm. and that's the drug of choice for symptomatic treatment of delirium. But uh, now more and more evidence um, uh, which uh, ask us to use uh, non-pharmacological methods uh, and uh, the use of antipsychotics should be restricted uh, to those patients uh, who are harm to others or who produce self-harm or if they have delusions, hallucinations, etc. Uh, otherwise, uh, the management should be uh, mostly with uh, non-pharmacological measures. Or oh, not, not, not just harm to others, harm to themselves. So yeah, actually, we, we spend a lot of time yes. harm to themselves. When we we we'll say to the families, actually, they are quite agitated, um, or not, or they're mildly agitated, but they're not a harm to themselves. They're not pulling out any lines. They're not going to get hurt. Uh, I, I can use medications, um, but once you start using medications, what you affect is the ability for the patient to communicate. And, you know, depending on everyone and everybody's family's goals of care, there are varying levels of acceptability for that. So if we really don't need to use medicines, we won't. But sometimes you have no choice and you have to medicate them. Um, but it's always the lowest possible dose for the shortest period of time. So they okay, say that mor morphine has no ceiling uh, limit. Uh, I mean, suppose delirium is caused by morphine itself. How would... What would what is the cutoff dose where you see delirium uh, uh, happening because of uh, the opioid? How how do we realize that? So so I think it's important to say that opioids typically don't have a ceiling dose in the same way that there is no ceiling dose for haloperidol. However, what you are gauging is as the dose of opioid goes up, what you are looking for is a balance between good pain control um, and minimal side effects. So once the side effect profile um, becomes too much or intolerable or adverse, then you need to consider a, an opioid switch at that point, or if there's a, a frank intolerance to the opioid. But again, it, it, there is a very fine line. So if you have somebody who is dying and um, their pain, for example, they've got, I don't know, cholangiocarcinoma, overt hepatic failure, but their pain is beauty, beautifully controlled with 15 milligrams of, of morphine in an infusion and a little bit of haloperidol for nausea. And they start getting frank uh, hallucinations and, and, and not from an agitation perspective, but we think it's from opioids. Um, reduce the dose of opioids. I wouldn't necessarily change it, especially if you think time is short. It's better to reduce the dose uh, in the same way you would reduce the dose if the liver is failing, if the kidney is failing, because the priority is still symptom control. So if they can maintain good symptom control at a lower dose, 
uh, you may find that any issues with agitation because of the opioids also reduce. So especially as organ dysfunction progresses, I often end up reducing the doses of the infusion. So it becomes a self-limiting problem. Thanks. Uh, and uh, there was another question uh, regarding uh, opioid uh, titration when to uh, suspect opioid uh, overdose as to cause of delirium. Uh, so uh, when you titrate opioids, uh, you have to look, look at the um, look at certain uh, symptoms uh, like uh, uh, myoclonus, extreme drowsiness, um, and delirium. Uh, so if this occurs, that means uh, you you should not uh, go beyond that because if you go beyond that, then you are going to produce more of uh, more more and more side effects. So once uh, the patient has these symptoms, uh, then uh, as Dr. Neil told, uh, you have to see what is the goal of treatment at that stage. Uh, if the patient uh, is uh, nearing end of life, then uh, we might uh, need to add uh, some haloperidone and things like that. But uh, if the patient is an active patient, then you have to actually reduce the dose of uh, uh, opioids uh, to make him um, free of uh, delirium and maybe a few days, maybe three to five days, a small dose of uh, haloperidol might be added if it is distressing for the patient. Mm. What about using fentanyl instead of morphine in such cases, sir? Sorry? What about using fentanyl instead of morphine in such cases when there is a kidney failure or whatever? Yes, uh, yeah, uh, um, but the problem is that uh, uh, mostly uh, uh, if you want to injection fentanyl, that is usually used only in the hospital. But uh, for uh, fentanyl patch, again, uh, at the end of life, it is not an option. But otherwise, uh, maybe you can convert um, it to an equivalent dose of fentanyl. Uh, but again, the problem is post. Yeah. I mean, I, I've worked in places where the only opioid we had was was morphine. That that's literally all we have, and so for you know the, the traditional teaching is that you don't give patients with with renal or hepatic failure morphine, uh, codeine, oxycodone, hydromorphone. Uh, when you're faced with <laughs> an availability issue, actually, um, it it works very well. You simply have to be more proactive and more alert. And so I, I have used morphine and all of these drugs which rely on both hepatic metabolism and renal clearance um, very, very safely with minimal side effects. Um, you just have to be really, really on top of it. You need to see these patients daily. You need to, to, to monitor, but it is doable. Um, in the UK, the experience with fentanyl has been, even in, in the regulated hospital setting, only palliative care is allowed to prescribe fentanyl or ICU. Um, and even if a palliative care doctor wants to set up a fentanyl or alfentanyl infusion, there are extra levels of check. We have to double check with each other when we do the conversions, because from micrograms to milligram, the safety risk is, is a thousandfold. So the risk is much higher. So yeah, I would be very, very wary about setting up fentanyl in the community unless you've got a very well-established community program. Yeah, now in India also, most of the political units, they have only morphine. So we also yeah. use uh, morphine even uh, with patients with renal failure or patients with liver mm -hmm. failure, because we, do know, uh, we don't have any other option. So we have to use it, but as you told, uh, uh, careful. Uh, so that's yes. the key. Yeah. You in have to be pragmatic. In such case, will the dosing regime be still four hourly or uh, do you space it uh, further? Uh, no, uh, instead of four hourly, we have to space it uh, maybe eight hourly or 12 hourly or even uh, once daily. Uh, suppose some patients mm. uh, who is undergoing hemodialysis. Uh, I had a few patients uh, for whom uh, one dose of morphine is required till the next hemodialysis. And then morphine is out, then we have to give the next dose. So depending like what, on the... What, so what dose do you give at that time? Like uh, how much would it five be? Five milligram. Or, oh my. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I would echo that. I've, I've seen patients who need 2.5 milligrams of subcut morphine once a day, once every two days. And for them, it works. Yeah. 
everybody's metabolism is different. And do you use uh, olanzapine, Dr. Neil? Uh, I, I mean, the difficulty with olanzapine is, is that um, we do. We, we use olanzapine quite a lot in the, in the patients who are more well able to take things orally. But in the context of somebody who's very, very end of life, the oral route is lost. There is no uh, injectable version of olanzapine. Um, but in patients who, who, are, who are able to, yes, we, we do use it. And particularly if they've been on an antipsychotic olanzapine for a prolonged period, we won't stop it. We will continue it as long as the oral route is preserved. Yeah, but it, it works well. It's um, okay. good for nausea, good for appetite stimulation, etc. cetera. Yeah. Uh, so um, uh, haloperidol, uh, sometimes some patients uh, uh, would need um, uh, uh, maybe um, uh, long, uh, not long duration, but uh, more than uh, two, three weeks. Uh, up to two, three weeks, uh, if uh, haloperidol need to be used, then we, we usually switch over to quetiapine, uh, which is another antipsychotic which has uh, less extrapyrimidal side effects. But olanzapine mm. is used for uh, refractory nausea and vomiting, and uh, it has some evidence uh, because it acts on multiple receptors. Uh, it uh, so maybe you can say it is a broad spectrum antiemetic uh, olanzapine. Mm. And and same same thing with the with the uh, phenothiazine drugs. So levomepromazine, Largactyl, Phenagon. These um, medications hit almost every single CNS receptor. So they're very very broad spectrum. So broad spectrum means that um, they also have a lot of side effects. So these medications will cause a lot of anticholinergic dryness. They cause drop in blood pressure, um, postural hypertension. So in, in the patients who are still well and still mobile, uh, really important to monitor when you start these medications and always start with the lowest possible dose, but very, very useful medications to have access to. Yeah, uh, so uh, levomipromacine is something which uh, is uh, timed as broad spectrum adiametic, but as it is not available in India, we use olanzapine. Oh, fair enough, fair enough. You probably get and less that, side effects with olanzapine, yeah. Yes. And there is uh, another question uh, regarding uh, the management of uh, hyperactive delirium. Is it the same treatment for hyper, hyperactive delirium? I, I, I think with hype, hype, hyperactive is almost easier to treat because there, there, there are positive extra symptoms. Um, hypoactive is easier, it's harder to pick up and easier to miss. So your threshold of suspicion needs to be even higher with hypoactive delirium. And again, it's, it's um, uh, treating the potentially reversible causes, you know, particularly with hypoactive, you know, are they hypercalcemic? Uh, is it a metabolic disturbance? Um, I have seen somebody with, with very poorly controlled thyroid function. We corrected it and the patient walked out of the hospital and went home. Um, for some reason, um, thyroid function was missed. So again, uh, the mainstay of hypoactive delirium is, is uh, excluding our reversible causes. And then the treatment is supportive. Um, and again, you, you spend a lot of time supporting the patient's family and those immediate carers to understand why things may be happening the way they are. Uh, it's very rare that you need to give um, hypoactive delirium patients antipsychotics, very rare. Um, what's often ca uh, the case is that my threshold for, for depression is actually much higher. So, it, you know, we try really, really hard um, to make sure that somebody is not depressed and look for sort of um, precipitants, et cetera. So the treatment is slightly different. But again, the common theme is reversing what's reversible and treating the treatable causes. Uh, there is another question on Indian setting. If educated caregiver or home nurse is there, can we allow subcutaneous haloperidol at home during EOLC? Uh, yes, um, we can. Uh, um, even though there is uh, uh, there is no uh, legal uh, uh, or uh, we don't know actual what is the uh, legal position uh, because there is a lot of uh, um, 
no uh, clarity on that but we do use uh, um, haloperidol or benzodiazepines at home and uh, the uh, there is a position statement from indian association of palliative care regarding end of life care where uh, they advise that uh, uh, the injectable opioids and things like that need to be used at home for proper uh, control of uh, symptoms at the end of life and uh, i think uh, we can move on to patient story presentation now uh, so uh, dr junita dr sunil I, i i was planning to stay for the rest of this but i have another meeting um which which i need to attend so i i have to to call off or dial off sooner than i wanted to um, okay if that's okay i'll i'll, I'll miss the last presentation uh yeah uh if, uh, you can uh, leave uh, if you have uh, uh, the other meeting yeah so th again again th thank you very much guys and and i hope the rest of the um uh, discussion is good thank you so much thank you thank you dr neil uh, for that uh, very interactive session thank you thank you so much thanks so thank much guys good luck Anu, uh, can we have the screen share, please? No. Rajinita, I think you're muted. If you're trying to communicate, <laughs> Junita here uh, from Malaysia. Okay, uh, this is just a short presentation. Uh, unfortunately, uh, our fa um, faculty cannot be with us. But anyway, we'll go through this. Uh, we had a 67 year old male diagnosed with adenosine squamous cell uh, carcinoma of the left lung with metastasis to the T4 spine and cord compression. He also had pathological fracture of the right proximal humerus and left proximal radius. So basically, both arms can be used properly. He was in pain. He uh, received treatment, six cycles of chemo, followed by uh, radiotherapy to the left lung, six degrees in 30 fractions. Okay, next. Right. Uh, he was well at first and then brought to ED by the children with multiple problems, uh, difficulty breathing and fever for a week, drowsy, restless, unable to sleep for two days, uncontrolled movement of the face, sounded like seizure, but the family was not sure, and pain uh, over the right arm and back for one week. So on, on further history, the shortness of breath and fever um, went on for a week associated with cough and yellowish sputum. He was drowsy on and off, restless, uh, insomnia. He did not recognize uh, family members and uncontrolled movement of the face. So you can imagine that the family were very anxious to see him like that, which is very sudden and unexpected. Pain over the right arm and back, he reported a pain score of 8 over 10. Increased requirement of breakthrough morphine dose uh, for the last one week. He was on 5 milligram 4 hourly. Usually, he didn't require much of a PRN doses, but then he was getting uh, more. So, more and more pain. So, the family started to give him more PRN breakthrough doses. He developed constipation and had a Bristol score of 1 to 2. No nausea, vomiting, uh, but also he had reduced oral intake. Next. Uh, clinically, he was <clears throat> alert to time, place, and person, but occasionally had incoherent speech. So it fluctuates. He caught for lying on the stretcher in the emergency department, uh, having fever, tachypneic, and lungs. There were reduced air entry over left lower zone. Uh, abdomen was distended, soft. Uh, but not tender, lower limb power of 5 over 5, sensation intact. Okay, next. This is the <clears throat> full blood count, renal profile, liver function test, and some uh, medication uh, investigation. Total white were raised, as well as the CRP was raised. So uh, he definitely was having infection at that time. And also anemia, 7.3. 
uh, uh, this is the renal profile. Urea was raised, uh, sodium very low, and creatinine was raised for him. Uh, the albumin is low, you can see that, and total bilirubin was slightly raised. Chest x-ray showed bilateral lower lobes haziness. Next. Thank you. So psychosocial aspect, he had good family support, financially stable, good for him. He moved from his house uh, far away to live with his daughter because of this illness and because he was receiving treatment close to his daughter's uh, house. Family was unprepared that the patient deteriorated suddenly. He was a cheerful and very loving father to the children. Uh, so when that happened to him, they were really unprepared. The family understood his illness and had mentioned preference for care at home. Next. Next, please. Okay. So we started on uh, continuous subcut infusion of fentanyl, uh, subcut morphine, PRN and uh, encourage them to give breakthrough. Started on subcut haloperidol, one milligram on night, and PRN for delirium. And started subcut midazolam, 2.5 milligram PRN for restlessness. The next day though, he became more restless. So the physician ordered CECT brain. So they off uh, the haloperidol and started on subcut levomepromazine PRN for the delirium. Uh, straight away stopped the haloperidol because it was not working. He was still very restless. Okay, and next. So family understood that the patient's wish to be cared for at home and he wanted to see all his family members. However, the family was very anxious to see him in pain, being restless. And then the main caregiver is going to be the daughter who was unsure how to care for him at home. So in the, uh, in the new setting, there will be the patient the patient's wife and the patient's daughter and her husband. They also in, uh, the patient's son who lives uh, in another place, but also very supportive of them. So all the family members had to get together and discuss with the palliative team on how to go about it because they wanted to go home. Next. Summary, 64-year-old gentleman with advanced lung cancer with brain and multiple bone mats. Uh, developed delirium secondary to multiple factors like pain, infection, brain mass, and electrolyte imbalance. Acute problems were managed in the hospital uh, and preparation to send the patient home and with carer education. Home visit done by the community palliative team. Sorry, I think I left out the part that when he became more restless, they ordered a CT brain and it showed multiple brain mats. Uh, the family decided not to do a whole brain RT because uh, after the family discussion, so they straight away wanted to bring him home. So we gave him a, a course of dexamethasone, taper it down, and the patient uh, was slightly improved after that. Okay, uh, next. All right. The patient had delirium due to multiple factors, uh, late referral to the palliative unit. Of course, as usual in my setting, usually when something really bad happened and they start to uh, refer to palliative unit. So the family was unprepared that the patient deteriorated suddenly. We had to discharge home with injectable medications and family had to be educated quickly and prepare the family for end of care at home and support with the community palliative care team. So this is a case of worsening delirium at the end of life. He passed away about three weeks after discharge. Him. Right, thank you. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Junita. Uh, so <clears throat> we are a 64 year old uh, man uh, with uh, advanced uh, carcinoma of the lung who had uh, bone mats and uh, uh, bone and brain mats, uh, possibly liver metastasis also. Mm. Uh, so um, uh, what are the, I would like to ask uh, the participants, uh, what are the, um, the predisposing factors of delirium in this patient? Okay. Hyponatremia. Predisposing factors. There is something called the predisposing factors as well as precipitating factors. So, what are predisposing factors? Age. Yeah, age. Age, uh, elder. Yeah. Uh, hmm. So, that is one uh, predisposing factor. 
advanced factor. malignancy advanced malignancy is another predisposing factor uh, so um, uh, advanced age advanced malignancy and the history of previous delirium or dementia these are uh, predisposing factors mm -hmm. and uh, what can precipitate delirium yeah uh, um, uh, probably he is immobile also so that's another factor what are the precipitating factors in this patient hyponatremia hyponatremia infection then mm, the creatinine was raised yeah, so is there organ failure yeah uh, increased uh, creatinine can I just share with you uh, the risk factors for the liver? <coughs> yeah, Can yeah. Can you allow me to share slide? Yes, yes. Um, other presentations? Yeah. Uh, Okay, I just share some of the risk factors. It's like it's more than 70 multiple comorbids and patients with the uh, ongoing comorbid of Parkinson's, dementia, stroke, or sensory impairment. And the precipitating factors, uh, like what this patient is having, yeah, dehydration, infection, polypharmacy, immobility, uh, and primary or secondary brain tumors, and also anti-cancer treatment like radiation and chemotherapy. But he has time with a chemo and radiotherapy. He's more of a brain mass and electrolyte imbalance. Yeah. Uh, and uh, bilirubin was also increased, isn't it? Bilirubin only 23, not, not too high. Albumin 21. 21. Uh, okay, I think... Uh, um... Uh, it's not in Indian standards. Uh, we talk uh, in milligrams per deciliter, but uh, you are saying in some other. Uh, some other millimoles. Millimoles, yeah. Oh, okay. Sorry. So I don't know. So I don't know uh, what sh should be the equivalent uh, milligrams per deciliter. Okay. <laughs> and also calcium. I don't know whether it is uh, hypocalcemia or hypercalcemia according to. Yeah. Uh, uh, what is it? Hypocalcemia or hypercalcemia? This patient did not have hypercalcemia. Did not. Did not. Okay. Then uh, he, uh, he had brain metastasis. Yeah. Probably divided by 10. <laughs> okay. I'm not sure. Uh, yeah. Um, yeah, that's a good guess. Uh, okay, uh, so um, uh, uh, there are some uh, precipitating factors also. Uh, predisposing factors, uh, precipitating factors. Uh, then uh, uh, this uh, patient had a lot of uh, precipitating factors. Uh, so what do you think uh, should be the goal of treatment in this patient? Should we treat the patient to reverse the condition or should we consider this patient uh, at the end of life? Whatever it is, we have to discuss with the family members and as much as possible to discuss with the patient when he is lucid. Uh, like what is the goal of care that they want? Uh, mm. Like a whole brain RT was offered, but they were not ready for it. So uh, in this case, since they were ready to go back home, so we need to uh, assess the home uh, environment and how the family is going to cope. Uh, a, lot of, um, a lot of support is required. And luckily for this family, they were uh, very willing to learn very quickly and they had no financial problems because otherwise it would be very difficult also. And a good thing was they live uh, around the area of the hospital. They were receiving treatment. So the community nurse were able to go and see them. All right. Uh, what are some of the things that we have, we can advise the family members uh, to prevent uh, recurrence of this condition? 
Uh, 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 okay. So how frequently would uh, this community nurses will go and see the patient? They will see the patient um, within three days of discharge. And then uh, depends on the situation. Uh, they can go usually two weeks, but in this case, they go after one week. Unfortunately, can rarely lah, they get to go anywhere uh, sooner, like not the next day. I mean, ideally, we like to see the patient every day, isn't it? Since he's on a uh, level of mepromazine and midazolam, pentonil, morphine, and everything like that. But we were not able to do that. So the best is uh, weekly if the patient is unstable. Okay, was he agitated? Uh, that's what's happened with this um, nursing care. Uh, no, uh, I was asking whether uh, was he agitated? Was there agitation? Sorry, sound. I'm breaking out. Agitation. Uh, agitation, it was, uh, it improved after a while, but actually towards the end of life, he had worsening delirium at the end of life. Uh, so the family members uh, call the, other than how home visit, they can call the uh, home visit team, uh, either officers and get advice from them. Uh, how long did he survive after the discharge from the hospital? Um, uh, three weeks. Three weeks. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, From my experience, delirium is like a sign this is uh, approaching end of life. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, I think what we need to understand is uh, this uh, patient is having an advanced malignancy with a lot of organ involvement, including brain metastasis and the multiple uh, factors which uh, actually uh, contributing to delirium. Uh, including infection, brain metastasis, um, electrolyte imbalance, uh, multiple organ involvements. Um, so uh, uh, we actually need to think uh, whether uh, we should uh, go to reverse these problems or we should uh, be doing comfort care for the patient. And uh, as Dr. Janita told, uh, we have to discuss with the caregiver uh, about their expectation and uh, <clears throat> bring it down to realistic, uh, uh, realistic expectation uh, considering the present status. Uh, and um, then we should focus at comfort care of the patient. Uh, so uh, 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 terminal delirium is something which you need to be careful. Uh, if a patient is having advanced malignancy coming to you with delirium, Please consider uh, terminal delirium as one of the different diagnoses. Uh, so, uh, in that case, uh, for, uh, you have to actually tell the patient, uh, caregiver that uh, this can be one of the differential diagnoses, uh, even though there may be some other uh, factors uh, which can be correctable. Even in this patient, we need to think whether the infection need to be treated. Um, so, um, Okay, Dr. Shravani says, I open, we can give IV antibiotic sending cultures. Would like to listen to your opinion on that. Yeah, uh, so uh, I'm not sure uh, about uh, what we need to do because uh, uh, if uh, there is something, yeah, these are correctable factors, infection, uh, but uh, if uh, um, Chris creatinine, uh, um, hypernatremia. Uh, so uh, we have to actually think that we need to correct it at this stage. Uh, I think uh, I would uh, discuss with family, and uh, if uh, I have um, a close relation uh, or a close bonding with the family, uh, and if I have seen this patient for the uh, past few months, then uh, probably I uh, I will be knowing uh, how fast uh, the um, patient is deteriorating, and uh, uh, we can then make a clinical prediction of survival. And uh, 
there is nothing uh, percentage you can say that i will not give antibiotics or i will give antibiotics uh, so, uh, that's a decision that we need to take after between the team and the uh, caregiver, caregiver and the patient if possible and uh, uh, yeah family education uh, which is uh, important and uh, as i told earlier uh, you have to tell the uh, uh, family that uh, what is going to happen uh, when you are going to home uh, what uh, or can expect and you have to actually prescribe uh, medication and listing um uh, the symptoms also uh, so this patient if uh, going to end up maybe pedoline uh, midazolam with the medication shall need but uh, they were also suspecting um, uh, seizures so how to manage seizures at the end of life that is something <laughs> which you need to educate the family uh, and uh, regarding food and fluids Uh, that's uh, that would also be another important question uh, uh, taking care of bladder bowel uh, those things need to be discussed and uh, i remember that i saw some question regarding fentanyl with uh, yeah uh, can we give fentanyl infusion and morphine prn subcutaneous at the same time so dr junita uh, uh, what's your comment on this uh, i saw that in the prescription fentanyl infusion was given but uh, uh, morphine was given as pr and dose uh, can we go back to the slide please uh, can we go back to this slide please go back to the prescription is this yeah. anu uh, meditation slide This one is it. This is it. Yeah. This is the medication in the hospital. Uh, when yeah, this is a continuous subcut infusion fentanyl. Uh, they were already giving subcut. Um, because preparing very urgently to come out from the hospital. Yeah, because uh, we we want to make sure that the subcut uh medication are all are uh, are suitable to be discharged home. so uh, he was discharged with um subcut medication and we gave uh when oh, sorry when he had the terminal delirium that time we also uh gave him subcut uh, preparation taught the family how to use it uh, make them sign something like uh, i will abide by the rules and i will make sure it is given properly any uh, extra medication shall be written to the hospital could there's also uh, we call this like um, special drugs so it has to be uh, it cannot be taken lightly by the family members uh, that's another the aspect of management uh, so like not every um home care team has this uh, uh facilities or can give away morphine just like that uh in some parts of um malaysia like uh we have simple uh, home visit team going out but only to give uh, nursing care but cannot give uh, haloperidol morphine or midazolam kind of thing it has to be really trained nurses and the nurses handling handling these patients at home are, are trained uh, in palliative care yeah so yeah i think uh, as simply as we say it can be done but actually on ground level at ground level it may not be easily done by everybody in every part of the country uh, only this special hospital with a special setup can provide this kind of um, services to patient yeah uh, so do, do not imagine that every part of malaysia has this kind of uh, services throughout not really okay uh, thank you uh, janita uh, uh, but if uh, the family uh, should be correct hyponatremia patient 
Uh, at first, he was, uh, even though he was ECOG 4, but still oriented. And during the fluctuation of his level of consciousness, he could still identify the patient. So when he was admitted to the hospital, I wouldn't really call it end of life. He was still alert and I think he, uh, he should be treated. All the electrolyte imbalance should be corrected, infection, and yeah, it, it should have been done for him. And it was, I believe, rightfully so done for him in the hospital um, because these are reversible causes. And so I think even though we think it is at the end of life, I personally would uh, uh, treat, the uh, treat the reversible causes, lah. of course, if the patient's family agree to it. So we managed to correct uh, the electrolyte imbalances, but um, yeah, not, not really the whole brain RT. But that's fine. That's what the family wanted. I think they didn't want to uh, hang around too much, too long in the hospital anyway. Not very comfortable. <laughs> yes, uh, fentanyl and morphine can be given together. We do it uh, regularly. Fentanyl, uh, usually it's fentanyl patch lah, because and then morphine being given together. It, it can be done like that. But usually uh, fentanyl and ongoing uh, infusion and morphine as a uh, PRN uh, medication. So that was one question. Uh, why morphine as a PRN? Why not fentanyl as PRN? Not fentanyl, PRN? Mm, in, from where I'm training now, uh, it's always like this. <laughs> why not fentanyl, PRN? Uh, because because when we discharge the patient, we plan to put him on um, patch, fentanyl patch. So fentanyl has to be the background analgesia and morphine is a breakthrough analgesia. Yeah, but in this case, you are giving continuous subcutaneous infusion. So why do you want to change uh, to subcutaneous morphine PRN? You can increase the dose, titrate the dose a little upwards and then reduce it, isn't it, to control the pain? Uh, subcutaneous... Uh, continue, CSCI fentanyl is being given uh, throughout the day, like background. Yeah. So we reach, when we know the actual dose, we can convert it to fentanyl patch. So the patient can go home with a fentanyl patch. But on top of that, the patient will need uh, morphine as a breakthrough. That's yeah, madam, usually what happens is that when we start fentanyl patch, then we use morphine as a PRN dose to cover that uh, until it stabilizes. But when you're already using subcutaneous injection, what is the use of another subcutaneous morphine? That's the question. Can't we titrate the, uh, the uh, dose of fentanyl as such to a higher dose to control that, the breakthrough pain? Oh, I see. Uh, I see what you mean. Uh, I see what you mean. How to titrate it? Yeah, yeah. I, I think I'm sure there's a reason that they did that. Uh, that would have been more easier, isn't it? And uh, fentanyl is a much potent opioid than morphine. But, so that should be used but, as breakthrough. Uh, yeah, I cannot uh, have 100% um, right or wrong here. Uh, everybody is telling the right thing only. Uh, so, uh, the problem is that uh, fentanyl is, as I uh, told, it is short acting and uh, morphine is long acting. So, might be, they might be considering that the pain relief should be uh, long enough uh, with uh, morphine. But the other argument is that we can actually titrate the dose of uh, fentanyl to a uh, bigger dose. That's also acceptable. So, uh, whatever is. Uh, uh, then uh, it is acceptable, um, but uh, usually, uh, uh, if possible, uh, uh, it would be better uh, if we use the same opioid uh, for uh, same opioid as uh, uh, continuous infusion as well as uh, uh, for uh, PRN dose. Mm, okay. Uh, and so. Uh, uh, and, yeah, uh, sir, uh, it was mentioned that delirium is a sign of uh, impending death uh, in most patients. So, how do we tell this to the uh, family and the caregivers? 
no. Uh, 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 actually, uh, delirium uh, has a poor uh, prognostic uh, uh, or delirium is a poor prognostic indicator. Uh, but <clears throat> there are many patients uh, uh, who is uh, who does not have advanced uh, diseases can uh, have um, even uh, when you titrate the dose of morphine, they can have delirium. Uh, that may not be a sign of uh, end of life. Um, but if you know that a patient has an advanced malignancy and uh, a patient is deteriorating, a patient is having delirium, then you think that, okay, is it due to terminal delirium? And uh, then you can tell the uh, caregivers that uh, you might have found out uh, many things uh, uh, which can cause delirium, like infection. So you will tell the caregiver that, okay, uh, there are many causes of delirium uh, in this patient. One is infection, uh, the other one is hyponatremia, uh, then uh, uh, uremia. Uh, but I also consider that um, uh, this might be terminal delirium also. Uh, he may not have a long time uh, uh, for him. So that's the way you have to present it to the uh, uh, caregivers. Uh, mostly the caregivers, uh, they know that uh, the treating doctor or somebody else might have told them that uh, um, this, uh, the patient doesn't have uh, much time uh, in front. So uh, usually they know. Uh, the only thing is that you need to explore uh, with the caregiver what's their insight. But we still correct the correctable, uh, even if after discussing with them and telling them the prognosis. Uh, uh, so, uh, end of life care, uh, if you look at uh, the literature, end of life care is a time, uh, um, maybe uh, it can vary from months to hours. So, EOLC is very vague time, vague time. Uh, and uh, if the patient is imminently dying, then I will not correct uh, um, uh, these things uh, because it is not going to benefit the patient. It is not justice also. Thank you, sir. So in this case, it is better to use the word terminal care rather than end of life care, no, sir? Towards uh, the end. Uh, sorry. Uh, terminal care is used in connection with uh, patients who has weeks or, yeah, uh, weeks also, terminal care. So um, uh, if the patient... Wait, wait, uh, only if the patient has hours two days maybe we can call that imminently dying sir if the delirium is due to morphine for example uh, do we actually uh, convert to switch to different opioid or reduce the dose and check for ourselves is this really because of morphine or something like that if uh, ideally if no financial constraints were uh, there, ideally, what would be done in such case? Are you in a railway station? Are you in a railway station, Dr. Ravi? <laughs> to have dinner, I just came outside. <laughs> the railway track is nearby. Okay. <laughs> Um, uh, so, uh, as Indians, uh, we do not have uh, multiple opioids. Uh, most of the palliative care units have only uh, morphine. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, there is uh, fentanyl is available, but still um, uh, it can be used. But uh, what uh, we usually do is uh, uh, if the delirium is really troublesome, uh, you can uh, reduce the dose of opioid uh, by maybe 25 to 30 percentage. Uh, and uh, uh, then uh, you have to uh, add, uh, if it is really problematic, like uh, uh, agitated, you have to give some haloperidol. Um, and you have to also see whether uh, there are any other causes for um, delirium. Uh, like uh, is there constipation, urinary retention, all those correctable factors you have to look into. And you come uh, came to a conclusion that, okay, this is due to opioid, then uh, you have to reduce the dose of opioid. 
maybe you can uh, even skip one or two doses of uh, morphine if you are giving morphine uh, and uh, once the patient is <clears throat> if the patient is uh, um, uh, once the patient is uh, uh, normal not normal uh, but uh, agitation is uh, reduced then uh, you can restart the morphine at a lesser dose <clears throat> 25 to 30 percentage uh, less uh, than that of the previous dose maybe okay, patient was taking 10 mg four hourly then you can reduce it to 7.5 mg uh, four hourly and if pain uh, is still present then you have to uh, see what uh, you have to reassess the pain and uh, you have to add uh, other adjuvants uh, to get pain relief because unrelieved pain itself is a cause for delirium Thank you, sir. Thank you. Okay, I think uh, we have to wind up the session for today now. Uh, so thank you, uh, everybody. Uh, Dr. Junita, thank you for uh, bringing up uh, this patient's story. Uh, so we had an exchange of uh, uh, knowledge uh, uh, because everybody practiced in, in different uh, uh, methods and um, uh, so, so that we can understand and uh, inculcate it uh, into our practice. Uh, so, thank you, everybody, for your active participation. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone, for joining. And I believe uh, all of us got a different perspective of palliative care in from different parts of the world today. So, that is what it is all about. The end of the day, palliative care is the care is similar in all parts of the world. So. With the promise that we will meet again with another interesting session and another eminent faculty, this is Sri Priya along with Dr. Sunil Kumar and Mr. Anu signing off from the Tipsy cohort. See you in the next session. Till then, everyone take care. Bye-bye. Thank you. Good night.